Mike, how hard is it that we should train in the gym? I'm glad you asked. I have a very well prepared answer for you. Would you like to hear it? Let's hear it, man. I can't wait. <laughs> sure. So basically, a lot of folks will say you got to train hard enough to make gains. And that's true. That's true as far as it goes. If it doesn't go far enough, I think we could do a little bit better. We can say you have to train hard enough to make gains, but not so hard that your next workout suffers and it uh, becomes a situation where your next workout is unable to make you gains because you went too hard. So there's a balancing act there of doing sort of the best balance of what we can do in the current workout and what saves us for later workouts. And that's not always the case because sometimes at the end of a uh, accumulation phase before deload, that's you just train as hard as possible essentially um, because there's no there's just a deload afterwards. But for most workouts, we're gonna be concerned with those two things, making great gains from the workout itself and making sure not to go too overboard so as not to have too much fatigue leading into the next workout and it being unproductive. And we can get a little bit more technical as to what it means to train hard enough to make gains and to keep the gains going at a near optimal pace. You probably want to start, and this is for hypertrophy training, uh, for muscle growth. The answers will be a little bit different for strength. You want to start at a load that gets you, oh, somewhere close to three reps in reserve uh, away from your target rep range. So let's say... You know, you want to be in around the 10 to 15 rep range. You want to start uh, at a load that gets you, you know, three reps in reserve at somewhere between 10 and uh, 12 reps or something like that. And then you essentially start there. And that's the first session. And it's nice and stimulative. And then as far as volume, you want to start towards the lower end of the number of sets that does a couple of things. Essentially, theoretically, it would be close to your minimum effective volume. But that's probably a volume where, you know, you get notably fatigued in the target muscle. You don't want to leave the gym and be like, my biceps feel 100% fine. That's probably not stimulative. I wouldn't bet that it's stimulative. Um, you probably want to get a small pump. Uh, and, you know, if you get a massive pump, it'll probably come with a ton of soreness at the front end you may not want. Uh, but no pump at all is curious, uh, unlikely to stimulate hypertrophy, and uh, at least nearly optimally. And you probably want to get, uh, you know, maybe like a little bit sore, at most a little bit sore. So if you get no soreness at all, it's probably fine. If you get crazy, crazy soreness, we have that problem where the next workout might not go so well because you've damaged yourself. And the problem internally of enough damage in a workout can actually prevent hypertrophy from occurring on a balance because your muscles are so busy recovering, they actually don't have the resources to adapt fully. But you essentially start on the low end of the volumes that check all those boxes. You start roughly three reps in reserve. And then every week after that, during your accumulation phase, you're going to increase something a little bit. It's some combination of increasing load and or reps, more or less every session that you do the same thing every week. Um, and you want to make sure the load and rep increases maintain or reduce RIR by roughly one each week. So that means you could potentially do your next week three RIR, your next week three RIR, next week three RIR. That's a fine way to train. But uh, if your next week is two RIR and then the one after is one RIR and then the one after is zero RIR, that's totally cool too. What you don't want is a situation in which you're not adding enough reps and load each week and what ends up happening is your reps and reserve actually go up. So you don't want to start a three RIR and then end up a four RIR the next week and five reps and reserve the week after because you're actually training easier and easier each week relative to your body's capabilities and outside of the realm of where best adaptations are had. So that's how you manage load and reps. Which one of those you manage, as long as your reps are within your general rep range, probably doesn't matter much. There are some detailed costs and benefits to each one and some best situations for each one. And then on the volume end, you want to increase sets uh, by each week enough to do a couple of things. Uh, the first is to fatigue the muscle at least as much as it was in the first week. You don't want a situation where three sets in the first week really did beat you up. Three sets in the second week felt very little, uh, very easy. And then three sets in the third week feels like you barely trained at all. It's unlikely that you're going to get your best hypertrophy outcomes, making things progressively easier just by getting used to them. So you want to be at least as uh, hard in the first week and probably harder just by a little bit. You want to get probably a little bit more of a pump each time you go. So it's going to take more sets to do that until you reach a real maximum pump. Maximum pump is actually pretty easy to calculate. It's not a very mystical thing. Maximum pump is when doing another working set doesn't increase your pump. Uh, we all know what that is. Uh, there's a certain point at which doing another set of bench, just you're maxed out. Your pump is as big as it's going to get and doing any more. Actually, if you keep going, you might actually get a smaller and smaller pump because you're so fatigued and so burnt out. Don't think you ever want to be there at hypertrophy training. And then lastly, so that's the sort of the bottom end floating you up 
So you want at least as hard as it was before, maybe a little harder on your muscles uh, taxing. Um, and you want the pump to increase up until its maximum. But there's a top end limiting factor, which is you don't want to increase the set number so much that you're still sore when you train the muscle next time, right? Because then there's a lot of interference. There's interference on the performance side and the biochemical side. So you don't want to increase volume so much that let's say you train chest on Monday. If your chest is still sore on Thursday, you probably did a little bit too much on Monday. And then next Monday, you could either do the same and see if your body adapts or even maybe a little bit less. So essentially, you increase reps and or load and you increase volume. Uh, potentially to the degree that you need, and this is all auto-regulated. Some folks might see an increase in volume that's very large through the mesocycle. Some folks may see no increase in volume at all from set numbers. And at the end of that whole process, how do you know it's the end? When your repetition strength flatlines and then takes a dip, you've reached your maximum recoverable volume for that last week. That means adding any more volume or even staying at that volume is going to be more and more deleterious to gains. And it's probably not a good idea to keep going. Your fatigue is very high. You want to take a deload, decrease all that fatigue, and then come back and realign everything just like you started. Three RIR again, lower end of volumes again, and then progress through. And that's how training sort of naturally builds itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's a good summary. Um, I'm just going to try to like re-say what you said and make sure I got it right. Um, so basically, you're mostly working on, say, like four-week mesocycles for the most part, right? Like about a month, something like that. Four to eight. Four to, Four eight, to eight, depending on how people. advanced someone is, right? Sure. Um, and so the general idea is you start the mesocycle with more reps in reserve. So you're not training really to failure at all in that first week. And then gradually you just get closer and closer to failure as you approach the end of that mesocycle. And then at the very end, say the last week of the mesocycle, you, you would go do a lot of high effort failure training. And then the very next week you would deload and then you would kind of just repeat that process again. Is Correct. that pretty much it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess your answer to how hard should you train, it kind of depends on where you are in the mesocycle. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. So you should train at least pretty hard and then you should continuously challenge yourself so that pretty hard – because. There's multiple arguments against doing anything else. For example, if you started training at your hardest, we could ask you the question of, would you still get gains if you weren't going 100%? You would have to take a look at all the literature and all the experience of every bodybuilder and say, actually, yes, I could make gains if I wasn't going 100%. And someone would say to you, well, isn't the fatigue massive from going 100%? You'd be like, yes. Isn't the injury risk higher? Yes. So why do you start at 100% and you would have to concede that that is a stupid idea that is not, is not a wise idea. So you say, okay, well, let me start really easy. And someone could poke you again and say, isn't that unlikely to guarantee growth? And you're like, yes, that's true. So, so why are you doing it? Uh, I don't know. So then you would have to start. The only real logical place to start is at the very low end of what definitely guarantees you some gains. And then because progression has to occur somehow, you make things harder and harder and harder, and then eventually cumulative fatigue will catch up to you one way or another. And at that point, automatically, you'll reach everything in failure anyway. So that whole three RIR to, to failure thing, it happens one way or another as long as you try to progress slowly but surely. So the essence here is starting at something that guarantees progression but is a little bit more sustainable, sort of the lowest amount of work and effort you can put in to still get progress, and then inching up slowly until you just can't go anymore. And then by definition, you have to deload. So it's a really, really sort of like self-containing process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, if I was going to play devil's advocate, I would say how, how much of a fatigue, and this is actually a question that I haven't answered for myself, how much of a fatigue difference is there between three reps in reserve and zero reps in reserve? I know, like, you think it's very, very big. I think it depends almost on the exercise, right? Because a three RIR on a deadlift will still feel very freaking hard, honestly. Um, and a zero RIR on a deadlift will feel like death to me, <laughs> especially. So there's a big difference between the two. Yeah, yeah, there's a big difference mm -hmm. actually. Um, on something like a, a lateral raise or even a bicep curl, I would say the difference between you know three in reserve and none in reserve I don't notice a huge fatigue difference personally on that. So do you think that this fatigue this fatigue component is exercise specific or do you think it applies really broadly across all training in general? 
So I think that the total amount, the absolute difference in fatigue is higher for the exercises that are more fatiguing. So three RIR on the deadlift isn't super fatiguing. Zero RIR is incredibly fatiguing, but three RIR on upright rows is not very fatiguing. Zero RIR on upright rows is more fatiguing, but still not super duper duper fatiguing because the, the difference is it's like upright rows go from here to here and deadlifts go from here to here. But this ratio is probably very perfectly aligned to the total fatigue they're giving you anyway. So for any given exercise, there is a, a big relative difference for how much absolute fatigue it causes for the three. So there's all the fatigue it causes from here to here. Here's three RIR, zero RIR. So the, with, upper, with deadlifts, it's this big. With upright rows, the whole thing is this big, and the three RIR is just at the top. So I think the ratio actually works out. And I will say that um, – in my experience, zero RIR training on almost everything, short of maybe calves and maybe wrist curls, is very, very fatiguing uh, compared to three RIR. Um, and if someone does not detect that there's a huge difference in fatigue, my first question is, are they really going all the way to zero RIR? Um, zero RIR can be described pretty accurately as a religious experience for many people, uh, as if you're actually trying really hard. And also it scales even more the stronger you are and the bigger you are. As you noted, it scales with the absolute load and the exercise like deadlift versus lateral raise. But if you're really, really big and strong, your lateral raise starts to approach some people's deadlifts on the very low end or something like that. And then it becomes a very, very difficult movement. So the bigger you are and the stronger you are, the more zero RIR training is exponentially more fatiguing for you than three RIR. So beginners and people that aren't that strong tend to judge zero RIR training and three RIR training as roughly equivalent in fatigue. Maybe, okay, zero RIR training is a little bit tougher, but three R is pretty tough still. As you gain more and more experience and more and more strength, not only is the absolute disruption higher from these bigger loads, but also you actually learn to tap into more of your motor unit recruitment pool and actually try harder. One of the interesting things about beginners is they actually can't use all, all of their musculature to pull on a bar, for example. They're not sufficiently motivated or well-practiced. For the first multiple weeks of training, you don't gain a ton of muscle. I mean, muscle growth is happening at an extremely fast rate, but it's just you know, there's only so much muscle you can grow. But your strength skyrockets, and they say it's because of neural factors. Well, that hell are neural factors making you stronger? They're letting you activate productively a, huge, a larger and larger percentage of your muscle mass. So when beginners say three RIR is not that different from zero RIR, once you get really, really advanced, zero RIR starts to be a real big deal because you really know how to get there. Another thing is uh, we have a lot of research on this now that beginners that think they're at three RIR might on average be at actually like six RIR, right? So what they're saying when they say that three RIR and zero RIR are about the same is they're saying is six RIR and three RIR are about the same. Yeah, you know, one's harder than the other, but it's nothing to write home about, but almost no one's going to true zero RIR. I would, I would imagine that if you asked folks who were in those studies where they tell, tell them to say, hey, tell us when you're two reps away from failure, and then they just start yelling and yelling and yelling at you to keep going, I would imagine that the folks that kept going and went to their true zero RIR are unlikely to tell you that they felt just as fatigued at the end of that two RIR as they did at zero RIR. They'd be like, oh my God, I mean, I guess I was relatively fine when they started yelling at me and I felt like I've given everything. True training to absolute failure requires a recruitment of your deep internal psychology to make sure that you're really pushing and pulling on the bar as hard as you can. So most folks, if they're not relative beginners, if they're not relatively weak, uh, to them, zero RIR training or failure training uh, is is oftentimes going to be very, very difficult, much more notably difficult than three RIR, et cetera, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm, fair. Um, wh what of the idea that, you know, people are kind of undershooting their RPs, like you said, like what would be your advice to get people to just gauge that more accurately? I mean, like, is is that sure. a is that a problem? You know, I mean, like if people no, are legitimately undershooting their PE, then maybe they're not getting to that point where you said, you know, you, you find that middle ground of you're pushing yourself just hard enough to get the games. Well, maybe they're missing that point. Like if if you're sure. gonna lowball it, then you run the risk of having people lowball it too much. So yeah, maybe just yeah. respond to that. I I don't think that's an issue at all. Uh, so who is it an issue for? Beginners. 
what do beginners not need to progress? Training remotely close to failure. They just don't need it. As a matter of fact, beginners need to focus on excellent technical execution and just getting incrementally stronger over time. And that's done best without training super close to failure. Only when your technique is really solid do you sort of earn the right or get the most productivity from training closer and closer to failure. So presum the presumption is that once your technique is really well set, you're probably not a beginner anymore. Maybe you're something like an intermediate. And let's say you're an intermediate with a problem that you don't ever think you're pushing yourself hard enough. Great. So all you do is you add a rep or two or add two and a half kilos to the bar every single time you come in. And it, it, all you do in week one is you start at what you think three RIR is. Now let's say it's actually six RIR and you've been cheating yourself the whole time. You just keep adding load to the bar every single time and or a rep or two to the bar every single time to the lift. What ends up happening is one of two things. One, you will either continue to get strong forever or you will eventually reach your actual zero RIR. Now, what that requires for you is to be committed to matching or beating your performance from last time. So last time in the squad, I got 12 reps at 200 pounds. This time, I'm getting 12 reps at 205 come hell or high water. And if you actually accomplish that, then you didn't go to failure, then you know you're not at zero RIR or, or, or failure yet. Then next week, you're going to do 210 pounds again for 12 reps or 205 pounds for 13 reps or whichever way you choose to progress. Sooner or later, you can't add reps forever and you can't add load forever. You will hit failure despite your absolute best efforts. So as long as you're completely committed to matching or beating your performances from last week, you it doesn't matter how far off base you are on your initial RIR calculation, it will catch up to you. And you might know later, it'd be like, wow, it took me eight weeks to get all the way to failure. Clearly, I was like five RIR or higher when I started. But once you know that, the next mesocycle, when you pick your loads and your efforts, you already have a benchmark standard for how strong you think you are and how much you have to take off of that to make three RIR, and you just get better at it over time. So as long as you're committed to matching or beating your performances from last time, this whole RIR not training hard enough problem completely disappears. And the only way it can continue to manifest itself is you giving up early in sets, even if you have an objective target. And if you're that person, I ain't got nothing to say to you other than training is recreational and it's okay not to get your best results. But if you really want your best results, do what it takes, lift the weight that you can. Sooner or later, you will find out where true failure is because you won't be getting stronger forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that's a good point as well. Um, I kind of have like a, a conceptual question for you. So do you, do you think that, so there, like, there are two kind of like opposite approaches to this question, right? Like some people think it's all about intensity and you've got to go all out and it would be worth it to drop the volume down to get that intensity really high or even drop the frequency down to get the intensity. What do you mean high. by intensity? I, I mean effort, like pushing hard, like mm -hmm. close to proximity to failure. That, that's what I, I don't mean load. I mean intensity sure, of effort. Sure. Um, and, on the, and then on the other hand, you have um, people who would say, well, volume and frequency are really important factors and it would be smart to pull the intensity effort back a bit so that you can push those variables forward in a like progressive manner, right? Do you think that one of those approaches is necessarily better than the other, more effective than the other in terms of maximizing hypertrophy? Or do you think that there are multiple ways to spin this and both can have their merits. And is there one side you find yourself leaning more towards? I think sure. I know the answer, but I'm not actually sure because sometimes you just got to like put it straight like that and see what you say. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So I think uh, we have developed and have to develop, if we're really thinking deeply about this, the understanding of what the overloading ranges are, the overloading thresholds are for these various variables. So what is the overloading threshold for uh, relative intensity? How many reps in reserve is too many and then you're not training hard enough and then you would have to do like an inordinate amount of volume to justify yourself. And someone could say, you know, you'd be m much more efficient, much better stimulus to fatigue ratio if you just did a little bit harder each set but did fewer sets. And the thing is we're pretty, getting pretty good at knowing where that bottom end limit is. That's like three or four reps in reserve and anything north of that is pretty good, right? Uh, another problem is that the research can't really tell apart 3RIR and 2RIR from going to failure. There have been many, many studies that have tried. And these studies are on beginners 
which means what they're really doing is going like 6 RIR versus 3 RIR, and we still can't find a difference in their growth. Now, they're beginners. There have been some studies in intermediates and slightly more advanced folks, and they still can't tease it apart. As far as I can tell, there has not been one good, convincing, well-designed study that has shown that going to true failure is superior to any number of RIRs that have been studied, right? Short of like, you know, five or something like that, right? So when people say you got to go all out, I'm over here left questioning what we have, why is that really the case, right? So we know the overload threshold is from three to roughly zero RIR, okay? If we go outside of that, then the guys saying you got to train harder, they win, right? They make it a good point. But we also know that volume has a threshold as well. And it's, you know, any number of sets, roughly between three and probably 10 sets per session per muscle group, produce robust hypertrophy with a mesocycle average of maybe about eight. For beginners and intermediates, eight sets per session probably produces the greatest hypertrophy, right? Which is to say that if someone cons insists on only doing three sets per session, but very, very close to failure, and saying, I'm gonna max these sets out, you can ask them the following very, very unfortunate question. What reason do you have to believe that going super close to failure is exceptionally more beneficial? And they say, to be technically tr correct, I have none. I have no reason to suspect that. Okay, now, what reason do you have to suspect that three sets, working sets, are going to beat eight working sets per session in hypertrophy? And they'll be like, well, an analysis literature will reveal that that's never actually happened. Almost every study, three compared to like, let's say six plus, six plus is just better at almost any frequency, by the way. And then you look, take a look at the frequency literature and someone could say, look, I want one session a week, fucking hard, bro, toast my quads or whatever. And you say, okay, let's take a look at how that compares to the benefits of higher frequency training. And you see two, two is unequivocally better than one. Two and three are, three is probably better, especially if you look at more meticulous analyses that have been done like folks like Greg Knuckles. And then, you know, after north of three, there's probably a trade-off there that us all wash, right? But we can at least say at least two, maybe three sessions a week per muscle is a good idea. And anything less, especially like one, it's just not supported by the literature. So then folks making that extreme case of very low frequency, very low volume, so that I can drive super close to failure are essentially saying, I'm gonna take super frequency, which has been shown to matter, and it's probably better off being a little higher than lower. I'm gonna take volume, which is shown to matter a lot, and it's probably better off a little bit higher. Now there's a limit to that, of course, then lower, and I'm gonna prioritize relative effort, which has been shown to be roughly equivocal within the range I'm training anyway why in god's name would you do that uh i have i've no well actually i do have an idea ego right people like trainer to failure because it makes them feel hardcore and they don't have to think much they can just plug and play and just do animal shit like man shit at the gym like fry, fry a steak with my dick at the same time and you know kill a bear and might as well kill it to failure shit like that so that's cool, you know, as far as it goes. But uh, if you want best results, you probably have a more balanced approach, which means, sorry, no, it's sorry. Okay. no worries, <laughs> which means, you know, you start, at th don't pussyfoot around and start at some fucking dumb shit like six RIR. Don't do that. Train hard. Train, start at three RIR at least. And if you want to start at two or one RIR, hey, maybe there's a good argument there, right? Start it there. And then as far as frequency, you know, train every muscle group, unless you're enormous and your pecs take like a week to recover, but you're probably not Marcus Roll or Ronnie Coleman. Maybe you could train at least twice a week, every single muscle group. And then maybe you can start at the lower end of volume ranges, whether or not you move volume through the mesocycle like uh, I do, or whether you keep it constant like Eric Helms does, start at the lower end of that three to 10 spectrum per session volume per muscle group and see if maybe doing it a little bit more volume helps you more. And if you clearly realize it's not at some point, then hem in how much volume you're doing and focus on the other variables instead. So the, I think the real answer is all three of those relative intensity, frequency, and volume have overloading ranges. And when you're within those ranges, there's excellent questions, probably irrelevant ones, as to which a little bit more of which and a little bit more of which is better. So slightly lower frequency, a slightly lower volume with slightly higher relative effort might be a really good idea. The other way, slightly more frequency, slightly more volume per session, but a little bit less relative effort, still three RR or above, may be a good idea. But if you take one or two of those and you completely get out of the overload range or intentionally stay at the very, very bottom of it, it becomes a question as to why you're pushing the other ones very hard. And it's probably if you took an honest assessment, you'd be like, you know what, I'm needlessly buying this, uh, biasing my training 
for uh, seemingly no good reason that I could explain to myself in the dead of night when I have to justify my existence <laughs> to myself before I fall asleep. Awesome. So, so getting back to the spectrum, I feel like you're kind of more like don't want to commit to either side, right? You're kind of like almost like all these variables matter to some extent. And you wouldn't be comfortable putting either volume or intensity or frequency as being like the most fundamental one, you know? Like I, I, I'm trying to, tr to see, I, I, if anything, I, I, based on that answer, I would probably push you more towards the like, it'd be better to sacrifice a little bit of intensity as long as you meet that threshold to get volume and frequency a little higher based on the research we have. Because you can go from three RIR to zero RIR in not detect a difference in the literature, but you can go from, you know, three sets per muscle up to 10 and actually see a difference. Or you can go from one workout per muscle per week to two and actually detect a difference. So it seems like that answer put you like slightly more in favor of like the volume and frequency over maximum effort camp. I'm trying to position yeah. you there on that spectrum. So my position is in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's the maximum effort camp that has put themselves on the outskirts, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not at the other end. Mm -hmm. I'm squarely within anything in, genuinely in, in the middle or any part of those overload ranges is totally fine. And anything that skews away from optimal is totally fine. Uh, or sorry, anyway, anything that skews away from optimal is incrementally less fine uh, and it would have to have a justification. So I'm saying, look, yeah, train hard. I think that the most critical, if you were talking about a philosophical perspective, the most critical thing, the most important thing is actually relative effort. Okay, if you are 10 RIR, it just doesn't matter how often you train or how much volume you do, because all of it's going to be a wash. It's going to be non-stimulative or so poorly stimulative that you'd have to do 100 sets to get the same muscle growth, right? And it would be slow twitch muscle growth anyway. It would be terrible. Stimulus to fatigue ratio is awful. So of primary importance is training hard enough in any given session. The second thing is to make sure that uh, you know your sessions are frequent enough so that you're gaining muscle on a net balance. Like if, if you train unbelievably optimally once every two months, it doesn't matter what your per session volume is. So your frequency has to be set after that. So first of all, train hard enough per set. Second of all, train frequently enough so that you can get some accumulated growth. And then lastly, you determine your volume per session because, and that does play around with the frequency a bit and how hard you're training a little bit, but fundamentally it's the third component. But if we take a look at all the literature together, as long as you're doing the frequency uh, relatively well, you're not totally screwing it up. And as long as you're doing the relative effort relatively well, then volume almost by philosophical definition becomes the preeminent variable to change. But you can screw your frequency up so badly and screw your relative effort up so badly that no amount of volume will save you. So all three are required. Uh, and I would just say, we just look at our own training experience, look at the literature and just zoom in on what we think is generally going to be a good idea. So to the guys that say you got to train all out, you can ask them, like, do you really think that if I go one rep in reserve, truly one rep in reserve, and I have just like five sets per session, four sessions a week, blasting the compound hardcore basics, you really think I'm not going to get pretty close to optimal growth? And if they say yes, they're making things up. Uh, and if they say no, I think that's probably fine. Then we're in that realm where it's like, okay, cool. What I would worry about is this. So for example, if I go train with someone like Jordan Peters or something like that, right? And I watch him do like two sets of all out super gnarly, crazy psycho failure. And then he rests like five days and does it again. I'm like, yo, respect, you know, that might be a good way to do things because it's not crazy low volume. It's not crazy low frequency. And the in the relative effort so high that like maybe it makes up for him. But if I watched him do two sets at like each one at five RIR and then take five days to recover, I'd be like, what the hell is he recovering from, right? So there has to be a balance there. If you're going relatively shy of failure, and if your frequency is relatively low, you got to do a lot of per session volume. On the other hand, if your sessions are very frequent and you're going, you know, a decent amount of volume per session, you can train a two or three RR and get great gains for a very long time because the total amount of stimulus of throughput to these pathways is still very high. So you want uh, to check the boxes. You don't want to leave any boxes unchecked. There's a, a spectrum on each box as to how much you check it, and you can totally play with those, and it's everyone's guess as to which one of those is optimal. But when you are not checking one of the boxes and you're saying this is the way to go, eh, it's kind of, to me, uh, a bit of a curiosity. Right, right, right. Um, okay, I asked you this question the last time we did a podcast, and I'm curious if anything ha has changed in the interim. Um, 
what do you think of the idea of sprinkling in some failure? So like, <laughs> um, so you just say, you know, you're doing a, your leg day and your last set of leg extensions, you go all out on that, even though it's week one of your mesocycle. Do you still think that that's a no-no or do you think that that's acceptable? I think it's totally acceptable. The real question is, is it optimal? Hmm. So I go back to you. Why is it optimal? Mm -hmm. What I would say is since the research hasn't given us really a clear answer on the difference between three in reserve and zero in reserve, there's still a chance that zero in reserve could be better. There could be an advantage to that. Like we, we, I don't think we can confidently say that three RIR and zero RIR are equivalent. They seem to be close. Like there, there's not like much of a detectable difference there, but there could be some merit to going zero RIR. I'm not convinced that there's a huge downside to it and there's a potential upside to it. Um, there might be. So yeah, why not? That, that would be kind of be my, my take on that. Um, totally. I, th I think that's very reasonable. I think if you go to failure on one set every session, you have to ask yourself another question of, is this interfering with the productivity of future sessions? Mm -hmm. And if it really is, then you should kind of stop doing it. Mm -hmm. If it's uh, putting you into a higher category of injury risk, then you should probably stop doing it. What I wouldn't want to do, especially if I was bigger and stronger, is start a mesocycle, perhaps new rep ranges, perhaps different exercises, and go all the way to failure in the first week mm -hmm. on any sets. Because that's your body's not used to moving like that. It's not used to recruiting those specific muscle groups and so on and so forth in that specific way. And there's a needless risk for injury when you don't need to do it at all. And by the way, if you're going to have failure as making the biggest difference in your growth, it's almost certainly true that you don't need that difference at the beginning of a mess cycle. You just had a deload. You just traded in some exercises and traded in some rep ranges for some others. The novelty is so great. Your sensitivity for growth is so great. Almost certainly get great results in the first week by going shy of failure. You just don't need to go that hard. Now, could you say the same thing about the last week? For example, if you said, now Mike, everything in the last week I ever do, I always stop at one RIR. I never try to go to true failure or zero RIR. Are there downsides to that, that I would agree with you 100%? There are hypothetical downsides. There could be some magic, especially delayed growth, especially in the advanced, that is there between that one and zero RIR. So I would say in the last week, if the shit doesn't come crashing down on you like a squat or a bench, and even if you have a good bench spotter, go all the way to failure is a really, really good idea to make sure you check all the boxes. I just don't understand why you would do that in week one because you're getting great gains anyway, not having to try that hard. Now, if failure training is fun, sweet, fuck it up. Just make sure it's not poisoning you fatigue-wise uh, for the next session. You know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're needlessly cutting your volume and you're getting a little pings and dings and getting hurt a little bit, bit much and you're like, man, tell you what, I always get hurt on that stupid fucking failure mm -hmm. set. Why the hell am I doing it? Mm -hmm. uh, then if you, if you can't justify it, I wouldn't do it then. Yeah, I think that's a really good clarification actually because I think maybe some people who don't fully understand your approach maybe fail to realize that you do have failure training built in. It's just you know, Every in a month. yeah, in, it, yeah, of course. I'm sure that's super frustrating, um, but it's in it's in the specific phase of your periodization. Whereas someone like, say, John Meadows might program that failure in the last set of each exercise or whatever. So he's doing it in like on a, like a micro scale, whereas you're doing it on like a more macro or meso scale. So it's, you're still hitting. It's like it's not like you're never hitting that failure. Like it's the boogeyman. It's just happening at a specific time point in your overall schedule. So. I think that's actually pretty clarifying. Yeah, that's great. Or are people there thinking that I don't go to failure at all? No, I don't think so. It's just like in, in my head, I'm kind of thinking like you might as well get the most out of that session. Like if it's not going to mess you up in any kind of way and I feel like maybe the fatigue differences are individual, then you've got really nothing to lose by throwing it in there. But it, I don't know, for some reason it just clicked in my head that it's like, well, you're still throwing it in there. It's just on a longer time scale than say most people who make – because, you know, the – take your last set to failure is a pretty popular recommendation. I feel like you're one of the few who don't really do that. Like you instead clump it all in one week at the end of the cycle, which is actually like, it, it does make, it does make sense to do it. Of course it makes sense to do it that way. Um, but I think it's like an interesting approach because I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, you might as well do it in every session. And it's like, well, maybe it's just as effective to do it all in one week. And then you get the resensitization, like you said. So I think that that, that was great. 
Sure. I mean, also, I like if we're getting real technical here, if I was going to do a failure set every session, I would almost certainly prefer that it was uh, in the first muscle group uh, that you were tra- in the first muscle group you're training or, or in the first muscle group's first exercise. So let's say you're doing bench press and incline dumbbell press that session for chest. I would say if any set should be taken to failure every single time, it should be the first set of bench, your first exercise, because then it actively functions very well as a performance tracker. Like you go to failure with 200 pounds for 10 reps, and then next week, it's still your first set, you're still recovered from last workout, you go to failure, and let's say you get 11. Hey, sweet, you're getting stronger. Cool, you can make the choice as to whether to add or subtract volume and load and all this other stuff. If you're going to failure in your last set, if you're changing the number of sets you're doing or if the sets before get incrementally harder, which they do, then it becomes very poor to judge performance based on that because you have to ask yourself, okay, my third week, I went to failure my last set, but my first week I did four sets. This week I did five. So maybe it's just more sets before. That's why my performance is down. Or you say, oh, I did four sets every time, but the sets before are harder now because I put some load on them and I put some reps into them. So maybe it's the cumulative fatigue that made me go down. The cool thing about testing your performance, the first thing for a muscle group in every session is you get a much more objective measurement of am I improving or what's the degree of accumulated fatigue over the course of the weeks, not accumulated fatigue within the course of the workout. So if I had to fail every say, so you got to go to fail every workout i would probably go to failure on the first set uh and then go sub maximally on sets after hmm. interesting uh, yeah I'll, I'll save that one for a, for another interview but that's that's an interesting one but it, it's all hypothetical anyway so sure. <laughs> it's not that that's not what you actually do um wh- one last conceptual question do you think it's actually harder on a per session basis to do a couple all out hardcore sets because this is what the the hardcore guys say is hardcore or to do a higher volume session at a seven to eight rpe like what's what's the harder session to you hmm i think they're about the same okay i think there's a it it depends on how many sets yeah but i think uh, i think they're about the same i think that um if you do oh if you're looking at what gives us the same stimulus, for example, in the first week of training, um, and you align the volumes of those, like two versus six or something, or some shit like that, um, well, two versus six is a wild exaggeration, four sets all the way to failure versus six sets at two RIR or something like that, uh, you might get the same muscle growth or something like that, but I think the fatigue would be higher in the all out to failure condition, Mm -hmm. so then the stimulus to fatigue ratio uh, is actually better for the group that didn't go to failure. Uh, and then they win because they can do better next time because they're not carrying more accumulated fatigue. And I think that that maybe is a concept that maybe a lot of folks haven't heard that uh, myself and folks at RP have been, and actually Eric Helms as well, and his folks are, are, are um, ex- expressing it. Uh, stimulus to fatigue ratio is a big deal. Yes, it's important how stimulative your session is, but it's also important how much of a fatigue cost you're paying for it. Like if we look at the literature just like with very, very sort of bland look and not any nuance, you can say that sets taken three RIR or zero RIR have the same apparent stimulus in the laboratory, but th- zero RIR sets have a higher fatigue. They might be a little bit higher, as, as you seem to think, which is a fine opinion, or quite a bit higher, as I seem to think, but it's higher. Mm-hmm. So then the stimulus to fatigue ratio for failure training all the time may just not be great. Mm-hmm. So what I say is maybe instead of going four sets super hardcore all out, Maybe do five sets where not any of them are super duper duper hard, and then you actually get pretty much the same muscle growth, but less fatigue. So the next week you can do more and more and more, and eventually you have your weeks towards the end where it's super hardcore all out to failure with you know slightly elevated volumes or, or more load or whatever. And then at the end of that process, you have to deload anyway, so the stimulus to fatigue ratio doesn't matter. I would just hate to train in a way that caused really good muscle growth, but caused a, a level of fatigue that was not defensible. Like someone could bring another form of training to me that say, hey, look, this is going to grow you just as much, but it's going to cost you less fatigue. Why aren't you doing it? Yeah. I would have no way to respond in any intelligible manner. I would say, <laughs> fuck that, man. You go to fucking go balls to ball, light your dick on fire. I don't know. <laughs> Shit like that. And, and people get emotional about this stuff, right? They, they seem to think that like, you know, you got to train all out. And a lot of that's really psychological and, and, and bears no resemblance to reality. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's it. I read a comment like that just before we came on here. It's like, you know, I'm sure just like I do, you get this this all the time. And I think, I know, I, like, I know you're not in the business of trying to like convince people, no, I train really hard, trust me. But to be fair, I think that people really 
the people who are the hardcore mentality and doing these like all out sets, but they're only doing a few of them because you can't almost by definition do a ton of them. Um, because the fatigue like, is Yeah, because of the fatigue. But I think that those people do tend to undermine just how tough a you know high volume session like you would do at a RP7 is. I think people hear RP7 or 8 and assume it's easy light work, but it's not. It's actually pretty freaking hard it's probably harder i would probably say it's sure. it's almost harder you know so I mean, you can you can balance those either way to make them the same level right, of difficulty right. but there is a monotony to training moderately hard with lots of sets that probably gets you the best gains overall that is frightening to people and, and a lot of people the reason they want to go hard and get out is because they want to fucking get out you tell yourself it's because you're a warrior and you have a lion tattoo on your face or some shit but the reality is you just don't want to do six or seven sets you're like fuck one set bro uh, one and done they you know in wrestling they used to like talk to us on friday and practices were short and sweet short and sweet the only thing i thought of why can't we have long and sweet practices you know why short a benefit like what do we do are we trying to leave a lot of people who pat themselves on the back for hardcore training, they're just lazy motherfuckers. That's it. So you got to – here's how I approach it. Take all that psychology and throw it the fuck out the window. Take a look at research. Take a look at what the best people do. Find out what's the best thing that works from your best guest perspective. Do that shit. However the fuck it feels in your head is fucking irrelevant unless you're in a gym to feel a certain way about yourself. Then that's really cool. And then when people say, hey, what, what's optimal? Say, I don't fucking care or no. I just do shit in the gym that makes me feel nice. So it's you know cable curls to failure or whatever, right? And, and just to, to end on a, a high note – Towards the end of our progressions, the way Jared Feather and Charlie and I train, we're doing something like eight to ten working sets per muscle to failure on things that won't kill us and one rep in reserve on things that will. That <laughs> is fucking brutal, right? That shit is – is uh, PSA, do you train high volume or train to failure? Both. We, we start out training easy, and as the mesocycle progresses, right. we get harder and harder and harder. I just don't understand why people would think the training needs to look every single, the same every single time. Right. That's it. No, I love it. Um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, shit. I had, I had something that I was going to say, and now I completely forgot it. You want a lion yeah. tattoo on your face, don't you? <laughs> no, there was something that I saw. Oh, it was a video. It was a video you posted um, about having fun during training. And the whole video was like, you know, don't go, don't take yourself too seriously. Just go in the gym, have fun and like enjoy the process. And, you know, you'll get so much more out of it. You'll enjoy your training more. You'll get better results. It'll just be better. And then at the end, you're like, eh, unless you want to go like really hardcore and that's what you enjoy. So in summary, whatever. <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. That was the, the funniest the day, thing I've ever seen. It was great. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, at the end of the day, people get really, really caught up in this kind of stuff. And I think they tend to start defending philosophies that matter to them a lot. And like, it's totally cool. You can debate these things with zero emotion whatsoever. Optimality and what's best to produce hypertrophy is a very cold, hard analysis of the facts. And your psychology is just going to have to line up with whatever the fuck that shit says. Uh, real athletes, hardcore people, truly hardcore people do what it takes. And if it takes a moderated approach to incrementally gets tougher over time, then that's what it takes. If it takes being a psycho, that's what it takes. I'll tell you what, in almost every other sport, you don't see going all out as the best idea. Think about powerlifting. How many powerlifters max out every time? But that's nonsense. Almost nobody trains like that. Okay. And how many combat sports do they have like the fight of their, their sparring of their life or the role of their life every single time? That's how you mince meet yourself right out of the sport. Everyone knows that. The top level guys know there's times where they're flowing, times when they're turning up the heat, and times when it's total war. And they strategically plan those out. It's not all all out all the time. Like we we have a name for someone in jujitsu that goes 100% every time. It's called a white belt. Okay, you stop doing that shit sooner or later because you realize your technique is going down the drain. It's way too emotional and it's the stimulus to fatigue ratio is dog shit that doesn't mean there's not times to turn it up all the way but there's a balancing act training has to be hard enough to cause adaptations but not so hard that the stimulus to fatigue ratio is all out of whack on average your training should be right in the middle of that spectrum probably starting in the early phases at the beginning and then in the later phase of training be it your mesocycle or whatever then it goes up to the top deload and repeat that's the best way i can conceive of it it's how almost every other sport practice works uh, and I think it's probably correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I think I'll leave it there, Mike. That was that was a great, great chat. I really appreciate your time, and I'm sure everyone else will too. Awesome. Thanks for having me on.